Set theory is a very deep and rich topic into itself, and as such, there are many formulas, identities, and various nuances and properties associated with set theory that one would encounter in a self-contained course just on sets. Now, we don't have maybe the time or inclination to go through all those things for the purposes of this course. Nonetheless, I would like to give you a feel for uh, what a set identity looks like. And one of the best known of them all, of the set identities, um, is something called De Morgan's Law. And De Morgan's Law comes in a pair, so there's sort of two variants of it, but they're very complementary, as we'll see in a moment. So one version of De Morgan's Law reads like this. If we take the complement of A union B, that's equal to or equivalent to as a set, the intersection of A complement, B complement. On the other hand, the alternative version of De Morgan's Law looks like this. We basically invert this uh, Boolean operation right inside the parentheses. So we take now the intersection of AB complement. And once again, we preserve the pattern on the right, basically, right? It's going to complement the sets and then flip the operation inside the parentheses. So we get the union now of A complement, B complement. You might use this when proving uh, various mathematical theorems or results in logic, as it's commonly done. So De Morgan's law and its result is basically enmeshed in our understanding of language uh, intuitively. So let me just sort of show you how that works or how we can interpret that. So notice what's happening, let's just say, in variant one here of De Morgan's law. When I take the complement of the union of two sets, I get the intersection of their respective complements. Let's represent this set A just as an expression. Um, let's say A will represent for our example here uh, the notion that it's raining or the event that it's raining. And let's say B is going to represent the event that I go to work. What does this mean on the logical level then? So it's raining. Remember, union can be read as the connective or. So it's raining or I'm going to work. What's the complement or the negation of I'm raining or it's going to work? So the complement works like this by De Morgan's Law. Well, that's going to say then that it's not raining and I'm not going to work. So let's say that one more time. So the complement or the negation of it's raining or I'm going to work is it's not raining and I'm not going to work. So both events sort of fail or both outcomes fail to transpire. So there is an intuitive sense of how we can better understand something like De Morgan's Law, which is again very common set theoretic identity. So I'd like to finish up here by defining one last operation between sets, and that operation is called the Cartesian product of sets. So Cartesian here is referring to Descartes, the founder of analytic geometry, French philosopher. And the definition is relatively simple. If I have two sets A and B, and I take the Cartesian product, or you can just say the product, then that is by definition the set of all ordered pairs A comma B such that A, the left element, comes from the first set or the left set and the B, the right element, comes from the second set or the right set. So there's the definition of the Cartesian product of two sets. So let's do a simple numerical example. So let's say the set A is uh, consisting of the elements 1, 2, and B consists of the elements 3, 4. So then what would the Cartesian product of A and B be? Well, again, I pair up. Uh, let's start with the element 1 here from A. I pair up 1 with each element in B. So 1, 3 is one element in this Cartesian product. And similarly, 1, 4 is an element in this product. Now that I've exhausted one, I move on to the next element for A, and that is 2. So 2 can similarly be paired with 3, and 2 can also be paired with 4. So notice the size, it's sometimes called the cardinality of set A is 2. There are two elements in it. The size of set B is also 2, and the size of the Cartesian product is 2 times 2, or 4 elements altogether. Now by extension, I could similarly define the Cartesian product of three sets, let's say A, B, and C. I'll just write the general definition here. The set of all triplets now, A, B, and C, such that the first element comes from the set A, the next element comes from the set B, and the final element comes from the last mentioned set C. 
Let's look at an important example involving a Cartesian product in conjunction with the real numbers that we discussed previously. And you'll recall that the real numbers were defined as the union of the rational numbers and the irrational numbers. And the important geometric aspect of the reals is that when I plot them, I get a solid line without any gaps. So then what happens if I take the real numbers cross the real numbers or the Cartesian product of the real numbers, well, I can shorthand that as R2. And by definition, that's the set of all ordered pairs, A comma B, where A and B are real numbers. So what's the geometric meaning of that? Well, that's nothing other than something we're probably quite familiar with, the two-dimensional plane. We have an x-axis and a y-axis. So in other words, if I identify the x and y coordinates of any point, I can uniquely locate that point in the plane. Similarly, if I take the product of r with itself three times, the threefold product of r, I get r3 as it's usually referred to. And by definition, once again, that's the set of all triplets a, b, and c, where the coordinates here, a, b, and c, are each real numbers. What's the geometric meaning of r3? Of course, r3, we're just going to add one more dimension here to our plane. So now we get three space, and I've got an x-axis a y-axis and a z-axis. And similarly, I can identify any point uniquely in that space by telling you what the x, y, and z coordinates are. The beauty of mathematics is this will to generality. So I could, even though it's hard to sort of grasp and wrap your head around, I could describe R4 mathematically as the product of R with itself four times although our intuition kind of leaves us, right, when we try to imagine four dimensions, but oftentimes it's done by taking three space and appending time to it. But if we wanted to do a more extreme example, I could talk about R10, R20, R1 million, right? That would just be a, a, a point with a million coordinates. So when we refer to Rn, now Rn is going to be kind of our home base when we talk about vectors and matrices and the like, Rn is just n copies, n is the dimension here, n copies, so n's an integer, of r. So it's what we'll refer to as a vector, okay? So I'll just label the coordinates here x1 through xn, such that each of the coordinates, I'll just call it generally xi, is a real number. So there we have our foundation for moving forward Rn. It's called an n-dimensional vector space, or sometimes called an n-dimensional Euclidean space. And you can imagine that as just taking these Cartesian products n times, so we get an n-dimensional thing.